Good afternoon. Welcome to the National Cancer Institute's first Twitter Live. Today, we'll be talking about the latest in liver cancer research. My name is Dr. Anuradha Budu, and I'm the program manager for the NCI Center for Cancer Research Liver Cancer Program. I'm also a research scientist here at the National Cancer Institute, working on functional genomics of liver cancer and molecular mechanisms of liver cancer initiation and progression. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by two NCI colleagues, Dr. Tim Gretton and Dr. Catherine McGlynn. Would you please take a moment to introduce yourselves? My name is Tim Gretton. I'm the uh, co-director of the NCI CCR liver cancer program and head of the GI malignancy section. I'm doing both basic research and um, I'm also conducting clinical trials for patients with liver cancer. And I'm Catherine McGlenn. I'm a cancer epidemiologist in the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics at the NCI. And uh, one of my major research focus has been on uh, studying the etiology of primary liver cancer. Great. Thank you both. Uh, today we're discussing our team's latest research into liver cancer. In conjunction with the topics that will be discussed in this broadcast, we encourage you to ask questions in the comments of this video or by mentioning at the NCI on Twitter. We ask that you keep your questions and comments to today's topic. If we do not get to your questions during the event, we will answer them as soon as possible in the comments. As a reminder, we cannot answer questions about your treatment publicly. Please talk about these questions with your treating physician. Please note that the NCI reserves the right to not post comments or to remove comments that are inconsistent with our policy at our complete discretion. We will add a link to our comment policy via Twitter. Additionally, if you have any further questions, you can contact the NCI Contact Center at 1-800-4-CANCER or by visiting cancer.gov backslash contact for live chat help. All right, let's get started. For our first topic, um, let's uh, have a brief overview of liver cancer. So what can you tell us about the current status of liver cancer in terms of its incidence and mortality, both in the United States and across the globe? It's probably a good idea to start with global incidence and mortality rates okay. because about 80% of liver cancer in the world occurs in uh, countries that are, are, have developing economies and about 50% occurs in China alone. Uh, the high rate countries in Asia and China are, are the ones that we've traditionally studied. Uh, however, in the last 30 or 40 years, liver cancer rates have been going up in many developed countries, including the United States. Mm -hmm. So right now, uh, the country with the highest rates in the world is Mongolia. Their rates run about 90 per 100,000 individuals. Uh, as a comparison, rates in China and some other countries in East Asia, they run in the 20 or 30 cases per 100,000. Whereas in the United States, the rates are more in the order of about five per 100,000. So they're considerably lower, but going up in the U.S. Um, in terms of mortality, um, incidence of mortality are very similar because the prognosis of liver cancer is poor. Uh, so mortality rates are very similar to incidence rates in almost all regions. And to emphasize here, we're, we're talking about primary liver cancer, which is, is a cancer that, that arises in the liver. We're not talking about metastatic liver cancer, which is a cancer that arises in another organ and, mm -hmm. then, and then metastasizes to the liver. Mm -hmm. What do we know about the increasing incidence rates in the United States? Why do we think it's increasing at the rate that it is? Well, there appears to be a couple of things going on. One is hepatitis Which, uh, C got virus. into the U.S. population a number of years ago, but uh, it was spread for a number of decades in the 20th century before it, uh, it was discovered. Once it was discovered in the in 1990s, it we were able to, to develop a test to get it out of the blood supply fairly quickly. So uh, the, the possibility of being infected now through uh, blood that you would get if you had an operation, say, is, is no longer a concern. Um, the other uh, fact in the U.S., unfortunately, is like many countries, rates of obesity and diabetes have been really going up. And we know these are risk factors for liver cancer, and so we think a lot of what's happening now may be related to this, this constellation of metabolic disorders. Okay. So we've gotten into this a little bit, but uh, what, what do we know about the risk factors that actually lead to liver cancer? We know that there are many of them. Can we mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that? Um, certainly. Well, in, in very high rate areas, um, such as we, we mentioned previously in Asia and Africa, the dominant risk factor is chronic infection with the hepatitis B virus. Mm -hmm. 
in a few other high rate situations, such as in Egypt and in Japan, the dominant risk factor is infection with the hepatitis C virus. Um, so those are the, are the two biggest players. In fact, it's felt that about, again, 80% of cancer in the world, liver cancer, is related to hepatitis B infection. Um, but there are other factors, as mm -hmm. we just talked about, mm -hmm. uh, obesity and diabetes. Uh, smoking is also a risk factor, as is excessive alcohol consumption. Uh, and in some parts of the world, um, eating foods that are contaminated with aflatoxin B1 is also a, uh, is a risk factor. So we, we know a fair amount. Mm -hmm. You know, let, let me maybe just add a few things concerning, you know, the Western population, because, um, you know, we heard a lot about um, the incidence rate in the world, and why well, many people think it may not be a disease that common um, in the United States and the Western world. You know, I, it's still among the number, uh, the first uh, top 10 killers um, or, or causes of cancer-related death, both in men and women. Um, it's um, quite common. It's actually number five in men and number eight in women. So, you know, it's not a disease that we only see in Asian countries. And um, I think one of the, the problems we have, and a lot of the research is also going on in, in, in this field, is that we do know the individual risk factors, but a lot of um, our um, patients actually have more than one risk factor. You know, they may have an underlying liver mm -hmm. disease, they may have a viral mm -hmm. hepatitis, mm -hmm. and then on top of that, they may be obese or they may drink alcohol. And, um, you know, that is actually oftentimes a problem because then um, these risk factors actually act synergistically mm -hmm. and increase the risk for developing an HSC mm -hmm. quite dramatically. Yes, mm -hmm. that's a very good point. So now that we know a little bit about this current status of liver cancer in the U.S. and across the globe and some of the risk factors associated with it, what can you tell us about how we actually prevent liver cancer? Well, probably the most important thing to do is to get vaccinated against hepatitis B virus. And it's been mandated in many countries for, for years now that uh, babies get vaccinated against hepatitis B. Um, there is no vaccine for hepatitis C virus, but there are medications now uh, which cure hepatitis C virus. Unfortunately, they're rather expensive still, but they do cure mm -hmm. the, uh, the infection. Um, <clears throat> obesity is something that I, we hear a lot about being able to control weight. I think that's probably a little bit easier said than it is done, mm -hmm. but certainly would, would contribute to decreasing risk. Um, also, doing something about controlling diabetes may decrease risk as well. Stopping smoking, again, would be helpful. Mm -hmm. And in countries where aflatoxin is a problem, uh, there are efforts to, to change how crops are stored, how they're harvested, and how they're consumed in order to, to decrease risk associated with aflatoxin. Okay. Great. Um, we know that uh, liver cancer is not the same between one individual and another. Um, what can you tell us about some of the health disparities that occur in liver cancer? Particularly, we'll start with some of the racial disparities. Well, in the U.S., um, rates among individuals of European ancestry are considerably lower than our rates among other persons. Um, and we know that the highest rates used to be among Asians in the U.S., primarily due to hepatitis B infection. Uh, fortunately, though, uh, with the introduction of the hepatitis B virus, those rates are going down now mm -hmm. among Asians. Uh, unfortunately, rates are going up among all other racial ethnic groups. Um, so we see that by 2030, rates will be highest among um, Hispanic individuals and among American Indian Alaska Native persons with rates among um, whites being the lowest still, but increasing. Okay. So there, there's also, of course, gender disparity in mm -hmm. risk. In yes. most countries, rates among males are about three to four times higher than they are among females. So we don't really understand the, uh, the reason for that, mm -hmm. except for men do tend to have more risk factors than women do. Okay. Um, the other notable disparity around the world is in income level, that liver cancer, like some other cancers such as stomach cancer and cervical cancer, tends to be a cancer that is more common in, um, in countries that are in, in developing and that it's associated with, with poor access to, poor access to, to health care and to lower income status. So um, it's, it's certainly one that has a number of different disparities over mm -hmm. several segments. Okay. Um, so if one has liver cancer, what are some of the signs and symptoms that one has this disease, and how do we actually detect and diagnose uh, this cancer in the clinic? 
So unfortunately, there aren't really any typical symptoms for liver cancer. We have, um, you know, very nonspecific symptoms such as fatigue, weight loss, pain, change in skin color, which we call jaundice maybe, which are probably, um, you know, the main risk factors. But, you know, if, if you really think about them, none of them are really specific and, and, mm -hmm. and tell us immediately or raise the um, flag that this may be a liver cancer. So, um, in often, oftentimes we actually just identify this accidentally, which should not always be the case because, if, you know, if I just may come back for a second to the risk factors, mm -hmm. About 80% about of our patients with HEC have an underlying liver cirrhosis. And um, th that's kind of a precancerous condition. So we recommend those patients to undergo surveillance by ultrasound and potential blood testing. Mm -hmm. um, we know that the risk for these patients, depending on the underlying disease, is somewhere in the range of 3 to 5% annually to develop an HCC. And um, this is, is, is very, very important because um, it will allow us to identify patients not only very at an early stage before potential symptoms may arise, but also at a stage where we can potentially cure the disease, which is obviously um, the ultimate um, goal. Now, the, the, the other symptoms um, that, or the, the, the way how we, how we go on once these symptoms are, are basically um, um, look at um, the liver and, and other organs to see whether there are any changes um, using ultrasound initially or um, CT scan and, and MRI scans. And then depending on the situation, it may be necessary to take a small biopsy from a lesion and send this to the pathologist so that he can um, then ultimately make the diagnosis of an HCC. And it should, it should probably be uh, pointed out by mm -hmm. us that uh, HCC or hepatocellular carcinoma is the dominant type of liver cancer mm -hmm. in most places around the world, but uh, it's not the only type. That's uh, true. Intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma is the second most common type mm -hmm. and is, in Thailand is the most common mm -hmm. type. Um, and the risk factors are different mm -hmm. between intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma and hepatocellular carcinoma. Okay. Um, what can we say about the current treatment standards of liver cancer? So there really is a variety of treatment options. Um, and um, usually, you know, we can divide this actually by early stage or by the different disciplines that help us um, treat the diseases. Um, there are surgical options. Um, the surgeon can either remove the lesion and um, alternatively, there is the option of doing a liver transplant where the surgeon removes the whole liver, the entire liver together with the tumor. Interventional radiologists um, have a number of different options. They can potentially um, use little needles to what we call um, ablate lesions using, for instance, radiofrequency ablation where they take a needle and then uh, basically burn the lesion in the liver. Um, once the disease is um, further advanced, there are other techniques um, um, such as the transarterial chemoembolization or um, TACE. This is a procedure where the interventional radiologist basically places a catheter into the hepatic artery and delivers a combination of chemotherapy and small beads um, to target uh, the feeding vessels of a tumor. And then we have systemic treatments as well as a radiation treatment um, um, to treat patients with more advanced disease. Mm -hmm. Are treatment standards the same across different regions of the world or are there standards? Well, I think overall, in general, they are similar. Obviously, they are not identical. Um, it also depends a little bit on the experience of, of um, the different area. Um, um, you, you know, you already heard that um, this is a very common disease in China, mm -hmm. and I would say the uh, Chinese approach is a little different from the Western approach. And um, then there are um, different uh, regulations about transplant, for instance, so that obviously um, has an effect um, on the treatment. But in general, I would say the treatments are very similar, um, where we have curative treatment options such as the resection and the radiofrequency ablation. The uh, TACE is probably the most common uh, performed procedure in liver cancer, and then systemic treatments, which are mm -hmm. um, obviously available throughout the world. and then based on our research as well as conferences where we report about mm -hmm. results from research, um, I would say they are very similar throughout the world. Okay. That said, however, in some areas of the world, uh, the poorer countries mm -hmm. uh, certainly don't have the wherewithal to have some of the more modern treatments. Very in true. fact, in some mm -hmm. countries have no access to radiotherapy at all. Mm -hmm. So 
in those countries, it's much more challenging to treat. Yeah, or even the very expensive drugs. That, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so we've heard a little bit about some of the risk factors for liver cancer, ways we can prevent liver cancer, the signs and symptoms of this disease, um, what can be done in terms of treatment. Um, let's discuss a little bit now about what's being done in liver cancer research. Sure, you know, there is um, a lot of research, basically, you know, from, and, and you can see this from, from, from the group that is, is here from the very early stage where we look at the epidemiology and the understanding of risk factors. Uh, to genetic studies where we identify specific genes and, and identify um, patients that are at high risk and, and understand the cancer biology to um, development of novel treatment options. Mm -hmm. So there's really um, a vast um, uh, area of, of research ongoing. Um, can you tell us a little bit, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, one liver cancer patient is not the same as another, and uh, in our research world we, we call this heterogeneity. Can you talk a little bit about what's being done in terms of studying heterogeneity in liver cancer? So heterogeneity is a very interesting but also complicated term. So I think, you know, we're starting to learn that cancer in general is not cancer, you know, and even if you talk about one organ, the disease is not the same in every patient. Now, to make it more complicated, if a patient actually has more than one lesion, even the two lesions may not beha behave um, similarly. And, you know, we have now techniques to identify those lesions and, and look at the source of these lesions and see that they may actually be different. And what we're trying to do is, is um, using different um, genetic approaches to um, really go um, to the root and understand the genetics of this disease for two reasons. Number one, to understand what the cause of the disease is and how this disease is, being, is, is developing. But secondly, also to potentially identify um, a, a, a treatment which really fits a specific uh, combination of markers that we can potentially identify um, in a tumor. I would say mm -hmm. that's still um, um, a future. That is something that is currently not being done yet, but um, I think that's certainly um, an important and interesting field of research. Yes. Um, and just to add quickly, the, from the genomics aspect that we work on in the mm -hmm. laboratory, we're trying to identify factors that are perhaps similarly expressed or um, signaling pathways that are in common between different groups of individuals so that we can look at particular groups of liver cancer patients as more homogeneous, uh, what we call subgroups or subtypes, mm -hmm. uh, that can inform us a little bit about some of the mechanisms and signaling pathways that are being altered. And this can be quite informative when we look to whether a patient will benefit from a particular type of drug. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that can be determined by whether their signaling mechanism that this drug affects, is that present in the patient or not. So this so, so are these only genetic markers, or are there other markers? No, so we, uh, we look at genetic markers, we look at genomic markers. So genomic markers are a slew of markers that can be anything from genes to small RNA species to small biochemical species called metabolites um, to uh, factors um, present like protein levels, et cetera. And we can find them in a variety of different um, specimens, from tissue specimens to blood specimens, urine specimens. Um, so we try to look for these markers that are present in uh, what are less invasive uh, biospecimens, such as blood or serum, so that we don't actually have to go and do invasive procedures, um, such as resections or, or transplants, et cetera, to be able to measure um, these types of markers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we've mentioned a little bit that the, in liver cancer, it's not only the liver cancer tumor itself, but also the role uh, or the status of the liver itself. And it can be quite affected by um, what we call cirrhosis or scarring of the liver. What can we uh, say about current research in terms of what we know about the microenvironment of the liver? So I think, if, if I may start from, from, from a clinical perspective, one of the main problems we have with liver cancer is that we have to understand that this is a cancer that is actually, um, that appears in a diseased organ. So we actually have to deal with the underlying liver cirrhosis and we have to deal with the cancer, which makes the treatment way more complicated. So that's number one. And um, then number two, yes, um, the environment plays a significant role. We, we went through the different um, risk factors. Um, viral hepatitis, alcohol, non-alcoholic um, fatty liver disease, and they 
change the environment. They have significant effects on the environment. They can change the behavior of the tissue. They can um, cause barriers for cells to migrate. They can change the environment and, and lead to specific molecules um, to be elevated, which leads to elimination of um, specific <coughs> immune cells and other cells in the environment. So I would say um, we're just um, starting to understand that uh, there are many factors, and I would say you know, this goes all the way beginning from fatty liver disease and, 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 and actually diet um, affecting this mm -hmm. um, to the microbiome um, and, um, and diabetes, et cetera, many factors that, that all um, contribute to the environment and may have an effect on tumor growth without directly actually um, being um, affected by tumor cells. Mm -hmm important points. Um, so we've mainly been talking about primary tumor uh, in the liver, but um, there's also a lot of research being done on m uh, metastatic liver cancer. So what can you tell us about where um, uh, tumors tend to metastasize to and what we know about ongoing research uh, about liver cancer metastasis? So um, the liver cancer can actually metastasize within the liver, then it can metastasize to um, local lymph nodes. And um, other sites or common sites are the lung, um, bone, um, uh, the peritoneum, and, and adrenal glands, um, which are, I guess, um, probably the most common sites. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of treatment, um, we, as of now, we still put these cancer types or the different metastases really all together and just basically treat them as a systemic disease. So, in other words, this is really the field where we use um, either systemic chemotherapy or what we call targeted therapy or potentially immunotherapy to treat, uh, to treat patients with. Mm -hmm. So you just mentioned immunotherapy. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the immunotherapy approaches that are currently being used to so, treat liver cancer? So you know, um, obviously there is, is, a, is a huge interest in immunotherapy and um, immune checkpoint inhibitors, which are basically um, uh, described as um, their ability to unleash the immune system and, and to really fuel T cells are one type of treatment that has shown in very early studies um, um, promising results, which led to the uh, approval of these drugs actually in the second line um, setting. So um, I would say um, immune checkpoint inhibitors are certainly um, one type of already approved immunotherapy, but there is a lot of um, on research ongoing. Um, using different mechanisms, using cell-based approaches, uh, identifying specific antigens that we can target, um, activating other immune cells and changing the immune environment so that we potentially get um, uh, an even more powerful anti-tumor immune response. Great. Um, so, Catherine, uh, what can you tell us a little bit about some of the epidemiology, the large population-based studies, and uh, the research that's going on there in terms of liver cancer? Well, one thing we're trying to do in our group is, is really understand what's going on in the United States. Um, and because there were no big uh, cohort studies when we, got, uh, when we started this endeavor, what we did is put together a big pooling project that brought together cohorts from all over the United States. Uh, each one alone would not be able to study liver cancer because there simply wouldn't be enough um, cancers in a particular cohort, mm -hmm. but by bringing them together, we were able to, to have enough power to study them in the cohorts. Mm -hmm. So we've been trying in that situation to look at the effect of diabetes, obesity, uh, fatty liver disease. We've looked at alcohol and tobacco and uh, looked at the effect of some medications as well. Uh, one that we've seen in several studies that has some promise is uh, is the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Okay. Uh, aspirin uh, really is one that has, seems to be somewhat have a somewhat protective effect. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the other medications that we've been able to look at are, uh, among women, menopausal hormone therapy. Um, oral contraceptives for many years has been controversial and has been uh, felt to be increasing risk, but in our studies we have not uh, found that to be the case. Mm -hmm. Um, the one medication that we saw that seemed to have a very large effect was the use of statins, of course, the cholesterol-lowering medications mm -hmm. that really seem to, to reduce risk. Um, we also looked at drugs to treat diabetes, and we did not find any, uh, any protective effect, although there's been a lot of interest in metformin in its ability to, uh, to decrease risk of not only liver cancer, but a wide variety of cancers. Okay. Um, we've also been uh, 
been collaborating with other populations to look at the effect. We've been trying to study microbiome and, and working with other populations to do that. And the effect of bacterial translocation. Uh, Tim mentioned that there's been a lot of interest in, in microbiome, of course. Um, you need, you need the proper materials to study that well, so we, we turn to studying bacterial translocation because there is uh, a well-known gut-liver access mm -hmm. that gets uh, disrupted in the case of, of liver disease, and bacterial products can get into the stemul into the circulation, mm -hmm. uh, and we can detect those and uh, have been and looking at the effect of other etiologies on this. Mm -hmm. so, there's a, there's a wide variety of studies going on. In my division, we also do genome-wide association studies, mm -hmm. which we've been involved with for both types of the liver cancer we discussed. Mm -hmm. So um, there, there's been a lot of activity, and we certainly hope now that there will be more and with more people coming into the field and uh, with our growing understanding of what is happening. Okay. So you mentioned genome-wide association mm -hmm. studies. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that is and how we can uh, put that in concert with some of our genomics studies that we do um, right. on liver cancer? Well, the, the aim of the genome-wide association studies are to, to look at genetic susceptibility mm -hmm. to the cancer. So uh, the large one for hepatocellular carcinoma has been going on uh, in the United States. It's been coordinated in, with our extramural colleagues. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the, the first part of that study is done. We hope to be starting the second part, the replication part of that study, uh, fairly soon. In terms of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, we're currently doing the first part of that study, which is called the discovery phase, mm -hmm. to, to look for susceptibility genes. And we hope uh, with once that is complete that that will give us a, um, a number of targets that we can test with the second phase of the study. So these have been done widely in many cancers. I'm sure people have heard about them in, in association with breast cancer, colon cancer, or so yes. forth. Uh, but fewer of these types of studies have been done with with cancers that are not that are not the big four cancers in the U.S. That's true. Mm -hmm. So I know I know you've actually been involved in some of those studies as well, which mm -hmm. have not necessarily been placed in, in the United States. Maybe I have. So I was just going to follow uh, Catherine and just say it's very nice that you're doing all of these studies in the United States mm -hmm. because we have sort of complementary studies um, mm -hmm. across uh, different regions of the world, particularly in Asia. Um, in China, uh, we have been um, studying hepatitis B-related uh, mm -hmm. liver cancer for quite some time and have uh, quite a large population that we've been following over the last few decades. Uh, we also have a study um, in Thailand uh, called Tiger LC. Um, this is a study enrolling about 6,000 individuals uh, who either have liver cancer, um, hepatocellular carcinoma, and as Catherine mentioned earlier, cholangiocarcinoma is quite um, uh, prevalent in uh, northeastern regions of Thailand. And so we're taking a look at comparing and contrasting those primary liver cancer types in that country. Um, we're also looking at individuals with chronic liver disease who do not yet have cancer but who may be prone to having cancer because of the risk factors um, that are present that we mentioned earlier, and comparing and contrasting these individuals to healthy population controls. Um, in addition, we have a study in Mongolia um, that we briefly mentioned earlier um, to uh, study uh, liver cancer there, uh, which has the highest incidence of can uh, liver cancer in the world um, and has a very unique etiology of hepatitis delta infection. So I think down the line, um, it'll be very interesting to compare and contrast uh, these large cohorts um, across the world, not, to on, not only to look at the, the genomic factors and genetic factors, but also to look at environmental factors, dietary factors, et cetera, um, and to compare and contrast um, race, ethnicity, um, and all of these other types of disparities um, that we discussed earlier. So I think this is going to be very um, interesting in the future and uh, provide a lot of uh, data for us to perform research on. Great. Um, anything else you'd like to update us about on research that we haven't touched on yet? Well, I mean, obviously, you know, there's this huge interest in immunology um, ongoing based on, you know, recent approval of um, immune checkpoint inhibitors for treatment mm -hmm. of immunotherapy. Now, to be honest, most of those studies um, are either being done in the patients directly where you test novel approaches, um, which are um, currently also being conducted here at the um, NCI Clinical Center, or what we do a lot is uh, we try to model this in, in animals, in, in, in mice, and, and try to study 
how the immune system really responds to tumors and, and how we can potentially um, modify that. Great. Okay. Well, lots of very exciting research on liver cancer um, here at the NIH and across the world. Um, I'd like to just briefly mention that uh, the NCI CCR, Center for Cancer Research, um, has launched a liver cancer program earlier this year. Uh, this is a multidisciplinary program that aims to consolidate all of the expertise uh, that we have on liver cancer uh, itself or liver, or liver disease and uh, create an interactive and collaborative environment that will foster more liver cancer research and uh, help with liver cancer care. Uh, this is a program that's going to uh, be multidisciplinary within the National Cancer Institute, within the various institutes of the NIH, and between the NIH and other institutes in the U.S. and across the globe. Um, we will have four main focus areas for this program, and we touched upon these four uh, focus areas uh, during our discussion. That is early detection, diagnosis, the study of various populations across the world, and treatment. Um, so you can find additional information about this program um, at our website, uh, uh, ccr.cancer.gov backslash liver dash cancer dash program. So I think now we're going to turn to some of the uh, live questions from viewers. Um, so here I think we have our first question um, asking whether there are any support groups for patients with liver cancer and their families. So liver cancer, unfortunately, is actually a disease where there are very few support groups. There are indeed um, some support groups um, for patients with liver disease in general, and they tend to also cover um, liver cancer. There are small groups um, for patients um, with um, primary HCC. I would say there's a little bit more presence um, for cholangiocarcinoma, which we have not discussed um, uh, that much so far, but which obviously is also um, a primary liver cancer with the cholangiocarcinoma foundation. Mm -hmm. So there are support groups, but um, I think, you know, it is nothing compared to um, other types of cancers like pancreatic cancer, where we know big groups um, supporting this or breast cancer, et cetera. There are support groups for um, hepatitis B. Yes. And persons who with have hepatitis B infection or hepatitis C infection, mm -hmm. but they tend to be a little bit uh, more more spread out. So, and perhaps that stood in the way of everyone coming together to have a liver cancer support group. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, we have another question. Um, how do I know if the symptoms I'm experiencing are caused by liver cancer or by some other health condition? Well, um, as I said, that's not an um, easy question, and, and basically, you know, the only recommendation I can give you is that you um, see your primary care physician um, who will have to do some, uh, have to talk to you, have to do a physical examination, um, blood tests, and then potentially um, imaging studies. Okay. So, um, let's see. Uh, what can you tell us about um, current liver cancer clinical trials? So. There are um, many ongoing clinical trials, and you can find them all on the website um, uh, www.clinicaltrials.gov, where you can basically just enter the search words um, liver cancer or better probably hepatocellular cellular carcinoma, and then you can even search by area, and you will find um, registered clinical trials that are currently recruiting um, throughout the world, actually, obviously in the United States, but throughout the world. Um, there are um, trials currently being um, done at the clinical center here. These are um, studies because we have a lot of interest um, in HCC. We do studies for patients with very early disease. We perform surgery on these um, cases. We do the uh, procedure that I just called earlier, transarterial chemoembolization. We have colleagues here that try to improve these techniques, or we, um, in, com in collaboration with these colleagues, we combine this with immunotherapy, with immune checkpoint um, inhibitor therapy. We have studies um, for patients with more advanced disease where we use combination treatments. Um, so I would say there are a number of studies um, for patients with um, primary HCC. We also have um, studies for patients with cholangiocarcinoma, um, the um, less common um, disease um, where we also try um, immune-based approaches. And on top of that, there are a number of small studies um, which are not specifically for only for HCC, but which, al which also include patients with HCC. And um, for this, um, I think uh, the best is to um, contact directly the clinical center to look for specific studies. Okay, great. 
Um, so our next question actually touches again on immunotherapy, so maybe we can just reiterate a little bit here. Um, are treatments that increase the body's immune response against tumors being tested in patients with liver cancer? Yes, absolutely. So there are um, a number of studies from phase one to phase three where different types of immune approaches, either a single agent or as combination, or in after surgery currently being tested, um, I would say, throughout the world, um, definitely um, in the United States as well as at the clinical center. Okay, can you um, tell us a little bit briefly about what kinds of doctors treat liver cancer? So, liver cancer is, as I, as I mentioned before, a disease which is um, a little bit complicated because you have to um, consider the underlying disease. So, um, in most cases, actually, our patients are being seen by, by um, a team of physicians or at least discussed um, at, a intervention, in, at an interdisciplinary um, tumor board consisting of um, um, hepatologists, interventional radiologists, um, the pathologist, the surgeon, and um, a medical oncologist um, where we identify um, the, the best treatment. So um, I think it's fair to say that um, in most cases, um, an individual um, case should be discussed at least by a surgeon, interventional radiologist, and a medical oncologist. Okay, our next question has to do a bit with one of the risk factors for liver cancer, um, that is alcohol consumption. And uh, the question is regarding how much alcohol um, is too much alcohol when it comes to actually um, causing liver cancer. Well, liver cancer has been a cancer where it's really an excessive consumption mm -hmm. that is associated with risk, unlike something like uh, esophageal cancer where you can you have much lower levels mm -hmm. that increase your risk, but in terms of how much is too much, it's difficult to say. Uh, the, uh, the past month or so, a couple of studies have come out and one said having one drink a day, mm -hmm. in fact, not increases the risk of liver cancer, but increases the risk of mortality. So um, I don't think we're talking at the level of one drink a day, but it, it's a little bit difficult to say how much is too much. Okay. And as, as Tim mentioned, uh, drinking on top of something like hepatitis C infection mm -hmm. or hepatitis B infection really increases risk. So if one knows they're a viral carrier, they should really endeavor not, not to drink at all. Okay, very good point. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I think this is our last question. We, um, we've heard a bit about liver cancer occurring in adults. What can we say about um, liver cancer in children? Does this cancer also occur? in children and is it the same disease or a different disease that occurs in a child versus an adult? So there are different diseases actually which occur in children and now we really start talking about um, very rare diseases. So there is something which is called the hepatoblastoma which is a primary liver cancer in children which is different than the HCC. There is a even um, more rare form um, called fibrolamellar HCC, which can occur in children as well as um, young adults. So we do see this um, disease also in children, but I would say that's um, um, really the, the, the exception. Okay. You know, in, in China, we used to see uh, HCC in young people, and it, even in adolescents you can get HCC and one of the demonstrations that the hepatitis B vaccine was mm -hmm. having an effect was mm -hmm. we saw rates start to go down in right. younger mm -hmm. people. Uh, it's, it's too soon yet really to see an effect in the overall population because most liver cancer isn't diagnosed until um, the, the 60s, among mm -hmm. people in their 60s, but we've seen rates come down among very young people in China as a result of the vaccine. So. Okay. It does, HCC can occur at a young age, unfortunately, if you have an insult like hepatitis B that tends to be uh, transmitted at birth. Okay. Very good. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you both. I think that's all the time that we have today for questions. Um, do either of you have anything you'd like to briefly add before we go? Well, you know, let me just, I, I think there's three things I want to point out. So number one is, you know, don't think that liver cancer is a disease that only occurs in nature. Um, it's a common disease in the Western world, including the United States, number one. Number two, it's a very complicated disease. You know, we touched upon risk factors. We touched upon, you know, the gut-liver axis, um, mm -hmm. the anatomy of the liver, which is very distinct, which is also leading 
or making this area of research, I think, one of the most interesting areas of research. And I think that's why there are so many scientists um, here at the NCI working on this mm -hmm. field because, um, you know, other than many other cancers where you basically have an organ and then you have the healthy organ and you have um, a diseased organ, in this particular case, um, it is, is very, very different. And only the interdisciplinary, not only treatment, but actually interdisciplinary research what we're doing in, um, in, in this um, um, liver cancer program that we have here um, is, is capable of, of leading to significant advances um, in our understanding of the disease and then developing future treatments. Great. And, and one final uh, comment about risk factors. Mm -hmm. Again, it's, it's in thinking about something Tim said is the dominant risk factor, if you can really call it that, is having cirrhosis. Mm -hmm. And so any individual with cirrhosis really needs to be in close contact with his or her physician to, to make sure there is no advancement here. So having, having access to quality health care certainly um, makes a lot of difference in, in when people are seen and, and what can be done about their disease. So it, it's very important, though, with cirrhosis to, to get constant follow-up. Mm -hmm. Very good point. All right. Um, I'd like to thank you both for you. a very thank informative uh, discussion today, and I'd like to thank all of our audience members for joining us and asking very interesting and important questions. Um, I'd like to remind our viewers that uh, this video will appear on the National Institute's Twitter feed, NCI's Periscope channel, and NCI's YouTube channel. Any questions in the comments that we didn't get to today will be answered shortly via Twitter. And as a reminder, you can always contact the NCI Contact Center at 1-800-4-CANCER or by visiting cancer.gov backslash contact for any live chat help. Thank you all for tuning in to the latest social media event hosted by the National Cancer Institute. Thank you again and goodbye.